Well, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Can you all hear me? Yes, good. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so, uh, I, my job is uh, I'm the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer of Channel 4. Uh, I've been there for six years. I worked there before for seven years. Uh, so I spent more or less half of my working life across two stints working at Channel 4. I'm also the board champion for diversity. And uh, both of these roles I'm very proud to hold. Indeed, the one uh, for diversity I actually asked for. Um, now, you may well ask what my qualifications as a straight, white, male, middle class, publicly school edu public school educated person is for that uh, particular job. And um, Una King always used to say to me, well, the, all, all those reasons are precisely the reasons why you are the, the right person for the job. Uh, and, and I was always able to say back to her, but, ah, yes, Una, but you shouldn't judge a book by its cover because what you don't realise, and, and it is difficult to believe, is I am actually half Brazilian. Uh, that's why I wear Brazilian colours. Uh, I, I also, I should just add, uh, I, I'm the only person at Channel 4 who wears a tie. Uh, you not expect people from Channel 4 to wear a tie, but I do that precisely to be different from other people at Channel 4 because it's important if you work at Channel 4 to be different. Um, my mother was born and bred in Sao Paulo. She came to this country. She met my father. It was literally a case of opposites attract. My father then became a conservative politician. Uh, indeed, he was for a while the Secretary of State for what was then National Heritage after David Meller uh, got into his toe-sucking. Uh, and indeed, it was on my dad's watch that, uh, that the DCMS approved the launch of Channel 5, which I'm sure you can imagine remains a source of great family pride. Um, now... My mother came to this country, I say in her, in her late 20s, uh, she, she, she liked uh, to guard the information about uh, how old she was, keep that close to her chest. She said, I can't tell you how old I am because my birth certificate was destroyed in a coup, um, a line that she was fond of saying on a number of occasions. Um, now... Uh, although she, she, she assimilated very well into living in this country as an immigrant, uh, she lived here for, for 30 years. She, she always said, and particularly after she'd had a couple of rum and cokes, she would say, um, look, even though I have really assimilated, and indeed to some people I might even appear as if I'm British, I will always feel in this country like I'm different. Um, and I think that has stayed with my brothers and I, and it is undoubtedly what has led me to, to Channel 4. So um, I'm really, I, I literally, I don't think I could be more delighted to talk, be talking here to you about two of my favourite subjects, Channel 4 and diversity. Um, diversity has always been, uh, as you very kindly said, a, a, a sort of central part of what Channel 4 does and is. Um, indeed, I think it's some of Channel 4's most memorable moments as an organisation have diversity uh, at their heart, whether that's the Brookside Lesbian Kiss or Slumdog Millionaire or more recently 12 Years a Slave uh, or indeed the Paralympics. Indeed, on the first night of Channel 4, there was a film, Walter, uh, which had Ian McKellen playing uh, a disabled person. Um, and I, I, we have always, I think, as far as television companies is concerned... Uh, led the way on screen in championing diversity. Um, and I can see that in the research that we do. So we, like you all do, I'm sure, do research amongst, in our case, viewers, and they consistently say that Channel 4, whatever minority group you're talking about, is three times more likely to be the one that viewers say champions people from that community. Um, but after Lenny Henry gave uh, us all a bit of a kick up the arse, which was a very effective thing for him to do, uh, we decided to take a much more strategic approach and an organised approach, and particularly uh, to focus even more on what happens behind the scenes. So people who make programmes and also people in Channel 4 HQ. I'm sure you all know that Channel 4 is a publisher broadcaster. Part of our model is, is that we don't have any in-house production. We, everything is uh, commissioned from hundreds of indies up and down the land. Um, 
And what that produced is our, what we call our 360-degree diversity charter, which is a five-year plan to try and further transform the people in our organization and that are involved in our activities right through the value chain, whether that's on screen or making programs or in Channel 4 HQ at all levels uh, of the company and other companies and across all the various protected characteristics, uh, w including, although I know it's not one of the protected characteristics, social mobility, which is very much a sort of rising part of the diversity agenda. Uh, we published the document uh, and we have committed that every year we will report back on our progress against it, which we do in Parliament. Uh, and we've created something called the Channel 4 Diversity Lecture, which this year was given by Riz Ahmed and last year was given by Idris. And the, the lecture and our reporting back uh, happen simultaneously. It's an incredibly galvanizing thing, knowing, knowing that you've got to go to Parliament and knowing that you're going to have people like Riz and Idris commenting on what you've done. It's an incredibly galvanizing thing to do to everybody in the organization to make sure that we're delivering strong results. Um, and I, I can tell that we're having uh, quite a bit of success with this charter because uh, we're getting some great results. So last year, we were, we've never received uh, an award uh, from the National Diversity Awards before, but they made us Britain's best diverse company. I think perhaps more significantly, we uh, applied for the most forensic diversity audit that's available, which is run by Ernst & Young called the National Equality Standard. Standard. Some of you may know it. Uh, it's an extremely rigorous uh, process. They have 49 different things that they ask you. It takes about six months for them to do the audit. And they told us uh, just before Christmas that we had scored uh, more highly than any other company that had ever applied uh, and indeed we were the only company that they were, had ever put at their top level, they got five levels at their top level uh, of, uh, of their award uh, which is called institutionalised inclusion. Um, now you might ask why we champion diversity and the reasons for it are incredibly clear and simple. I mean first of all we believe that there's a moral imperative uh, behind it. Uh, second of all, you know, it's actually in our public, our statutory public service remit. So, you know, at some level we have to do it. But, but what I would say though, and this is incredibly important, is that um, regardless of those two things, we would do it anyway because what we find is, is that it makes our business more successful. So, very specifically, it makes us more creative, it makes us more innovative, and by dint of those two things, it makes us more commercially successful. Now, how does that, how, how does the sort of mechanics of that happen? Well, at, we find the same thing that numerous academic studies around the world have found, which is that when you're in a problem-solving situation, uh, and we're all in problem-solving situations all of the time, uh, and you know we're in strongly, all of us, in creative situations, when you bring people who are different into, the, into that process, uh, they bring with them different information, uh, a whole different kind of background way of seeing the world, and, and therefore they bring different ideas. And if you manage the process of all of that difference well, which is what inclusion is really all about, then you get more creative, more innovative ideas out the other end. And I see this literally every day uh, at Channel 4. The other thing which happens, which uh, I think I was certainly surprised by, is that it also brings higher level uh, of sort of productivity and performance by individuals. So how that works is if, if, the, if, we're, all go, if we're all part of a creative process uh, and I know that there's more difference than similarity between us, I am going to think through my own idea more thoroughly before I get to the room and pitch it harder because I know that the competition for ideas and different ideas is going to be greater. But also, I'm going to, because I know that you're doing the same thing, I'm going to listen to your ideas and I'm more likely to incorporate what I think are the strong points of your ideas into my ideas. And that's when you get a fantastic sort of building of different creative solutions. That's what we find, and it certainly is corroborated in a wide variety of academic studies. Um, all of that said, 
uh, as was alluded to, the, I think the, the best example in our organisation uh, uh, of diversity at work and the impact that it has on performance is around the Paralympic Games. Now, Paralympics is uh, the... We, for any of us that were involved in it, lucky enough to be involved in it uh, in 2012 and beyond, it's the best thing that we've ever been involved in. We all feel incredibly lucky uh, to have been part of it. Um, Jeremy Isaacs, who some of you may know or have heard of, who was the founding chief executive uh, of Channel 4, absolutely brilliant man, but I think it's fair to say not known for complimenting his successors. Um, he, he, Jeremy, uh, who I'm an enormous fan of, uh, not least because of what he said, he said, uh, I think the Paralympics in 2012 was Channel 4's finest hour throughout, the, throughout all its history. That's very nice. Um, so when Rio came around, uh, you can probably imagine it actually created a sort of mixed set of emotions because one emotion was, great, we get the opportunity to do the Paralympics again. Uh, the other emotion was, oh, shit, uh, we ought to try and make it better than last time. And I think the most important thing that we did was we decided very, very early on that it's almost impossible to try and be better. You've got to try and be different. So that, that is what we tried to do. And I think that we did so with some success. So, you know, we changed the tone of it. We made it much more entertaining. We brought the last leg into the centre of the schedule before it had been on the fringes that had been this highlight show. Um, and um, I don't think that if we'd done a sweepstake, we weren't sort of brave enough to do a sweepstake on what the ratings would, would, were, would have been in Rio, but uh, we, I think we would have all said, well, they'll be down because you, you, you don't have home advantage and you have uh, time zone difference. But amazingly, the ratings amongst young people, which is the core commercial audience for us, was actually up in Rio versus London. So why did that happen? I, I think it happened because we went even more sort of full throttle in our commitment to diversity on screen and off screen. And we, 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 our commitments were much more across a wide waterfront of, of everything that we do. So let me give you some examples. In London, 50% of the on-screen talent were dis had, a, had a disability. Uh, in Rio, that was two-thirds. Uh, in London, we didn't even measure the uh, three or so hundred production people uh, uh, from IMG and Sunset and Vine who had a disability. Uh, for London, we, for Rio, we said that uh, it would be 15%. We actually got to 19%. That's an extremely high number. We trained 24 young people who had never worked in television before, all of whom had a disability, gave them a year's worth of training, working with a variety of uh, production companies and other broadcasters, um, and, and trained them up. And the, the, the culmination of their year was to get to go to Rio to be part of the production for the Games. I met them just before... Uh, before the games uh, began uh, in, in the UK and said to them, look, uh, you know, has it all been going? Uh, what have you learnt? And they, they said, uh, well, we've learnt an enormous amount. And then a young guy uh, called Josh with fis, uh, who has cystic fibrosis uh, stuck his hand up and said, I, can I just say that while we've undoubtedly learnt a lot and we're very grateful for that, the amazing thing is that we all agree is that the companies that we've been working with have learnt an enormous amount. They've learnt an enormous about about us, but also just generally what it's like to work with people who have a disability. And then they will never lose that. They they now have a, a, a sort of inquisitiveness, which is going to apply throughout all of the, their life for the rest of their life. Um, and the the... The upshot of all of this was we had an experience when we were in Rio that was very much like witnessing the world changing in front of our eyes. And let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, in London, the, the IPC, the organisers, had gone round all of the international broadcasting studios uh, and uh, towards the end of the Games, they come to us and they said, we've just done the tour and... Uh, there's only one studio, one studio that has disabled people in it, and that's yours, Channel 4. They did the same exercise in Rio. About two or three days before the Games ended, they came around and said, we've just done the same exercise. 
uh, all the international broadcasting studios, every single one had more than one disabled person in it, both on screen and behind the camera. So that was an amazing thing for us to witness. The other thing that we, we had was we, you know, you go to events um, and uh, well, there's 165 different countries represented, you know, these sort of cocktail parties and you're all wearing lanyards uh, and what's happening is everyone's going around seeing, well, what does your lanyard say? Um, you know, who's this idiot? And the minute they see Channel 4, uh, such, I'm happy to say, is our reputation in the movement that literally people will sort of take a step back and they say, oh, God, I've got these rose petals that I I've been ha holding in my pocket, which I've been waiting to cast at your feet. Should I meet someone from Channel 4? And, and then they would say, um, look, you're, this last leg program you've got is absolutely amazing. I heard about it. You're mixing disability and sport and comedy, that's just not possible. And yet, when I watch the program, you've done it. They would also say, uh, you know, people from, from countries all over the world, you do realise that the Yes, I Can advert that you made is being played across our country in schools to teach kids about inclusion. And, you know, that's a tremendous thing for, for us uh, and one that we had not planned. Uh, someone in the press office got a call uh, just after the games from someone who said, hello, I'm from the exam board of Great Britain, to which the person in the press office said, well, this is Channel 4, I think you might have the wrong number. Uh, and they said, no, we do have the right number. Uh, we are just ringing to tell you that your marketing campaign and coverage of the Paralympics is now being included in the A-level and GCSE curriculum for media studies. And certainly, uh, as a parent, I can't think of a, you know, a, a better sort of uh, accolade than that. Um, the final thing I just want to talk about is the uh, competition that we ran for advertisers to win a million quid's worth of airtime uh, for producing the campaign that would that best... Uh, featured disabled people or had disability as part of the theme. We thought that we would uh, get about 20 or 30 applicants. We got more than 100 brands applied. We shortlisted eight. They came into the office and pitched to us, and one by one, they all said the same thing. We don't know why we've not been thinking about disability, but now that you've opened our minds to it, we're, we're going to be featuring disabled people more in our advertising, whether it's for, for this brand or another brand, whether we win this competition or not. So that was an amazing thing. But even better was the competition was won by Mars, who's Maltesers brand. Uh, they, they ended up making three ads. You've probably seen them. They're absolutely brilliant. Uh, they work very closely with Scope, uh, who helped them with all issues around representation. And uh, they were really worried about them before they put them out because they're a little bit risque, sort of how's the public going to react? Is the public going to say, look, you're trying to make money out of disabled people? I wasn't worried about that at all. I thought the public would love them. And, and I, you know, luckily, I was right. The public did love them to the extent that they then, they then came back and said, Mars, that first of all, they said, we tested these adverts. Uh, these adverts tested better than any other campaign that we've done for five years. And then post-campaign, they came back and said, we have had the largest sales uplift from a marketing campaign for this brand for eight years. So to me, uh, it's very, very simple. You know, disability sells. Uh, and, you know, I, I think diversity sells. It sells when you put it in your product, uh, the wide variety of our programs that, that feature uh, people of all different types of diversity, but also when you have as diverse a range of people involved in all of the processes that you're going through to produce that amazing product. 